we have the great opportunity to welcome Anne Scheftel today. Um, she's probably the most well-known person working in conservation of Buddhist art all over the world. So um, we're extremely um, excited. She's at Dalhousie University working with museums, in universities, in communities, with monasteries since the 1970s. So it's really exciting. And I think also, Anne, you're working with Buddhist caretaker training. So we'd like to hear about that also. So welcome and welcome to our guest lecture today. Thank you so much. I want to begin this talk with thanks to the gods of technology that allow us to all communicate. To Diane and hardworking people there in Kathmandu to make, make this possible, especially to my mentors in conservation, to my esteemed colleagues, Buddhist masters, scholars, painters, tailors, monks and nuns, who have allowed me to interview, document, and photograph them since 1970, when my work with Tonkas began. And I want to thank our patrons and advisors, including Pema Chodhan Foundation, Kensei Foundation, the Rubin Foundation, Shambhala Trust, and Thomas Donahue and Henry Shen. Thank you, everyone, and to all of our donors and supporters. Tanka conservation in monasteries is as complicated as the Tanka form itself. It's a complex, composite art form spanning centuries and continents and still evolving. The fact is that even traditional and respectful actions in a monastery can also cause physical damage to tankas. In the early 1950s, I first saw tankas in a New York museum on a class trip. And I truly believe in museum visits by children and children who are not a Buddhist visiting monasteries. Early childhood education is the best place for children to appreciate their culture and other people's culture and to learn about preservation. In 1970, I began to research in Buddhist monasteries in Nepal and India. This is a picture of me in India in 1970 with a patron. I was fortunate to meet scholars, painters, tailors, and Dharma teachers who were patient enough to allow me to interview them and document their techniques. In 1970, I encountered in Sarnath, His Holiness the 16th Karmapa, who later told me this was my Dharma work for this lifetime, to pres preserve tankas and other Buddhist treasures. And then I had to go to graduate school for 10 years to learn how to do it properly. If we ask who painted Tankas, well, this is a famous painter who's no longer alive. He was recognized as a great painter during his life, but his paintings were not documented as his. This master, Kamtrul Rinpoche, left Tibet and founded the first arts and meditation community in India, Tashijan, which is still going strong as a meditation center. Although he was trained traditionally in Tibet and painted with earth pigments mixed in distilled yakai glue, he had to accept and adapt what was available in a new country and use different painting materials. I've always been interested and have documented great meditation masters who are also master painters. It's a special class of tankas where a master wakes up and paints a tanka from his own meditation vision. In 1970, when I met the previous Karmapa and also the eighth Kamtul Rinpoche, I also went to Tibet House in Delhi to research tankas and encountered Gaelic Rinpoche, 
Gellert Rimche was a scholar in Tibet House in 1970, and his wife, Daisy, was the director. He was so generous with his knowledge and in 1970 talked to me for hours about tonka technique and especially how tonkas are painted to look old for sale, what we call fakes. He was very generous with his knowledge. In 1970, I visited in Delhi, the National Museum Conservation Lab. It looked like this then, men wearing suits, enacting chemistry. This was one of the first conservation labs I saw in Asia. It's different now, but it was not welcoming to a young woman. But it is now. In 1970, in Nepal, I traveled by bus, car, and a tiny plane. The plane had folding chairs that weren't even affixed to the floor. And I visited monasteries and documented traditional arts and interviewed Buddhist teachers and artists in 1970 in Nepal. Here are some of my Kodachrome images from then. And the interesting thing is that these images are probably familiar to many of you who are with us today. The craftsmen you see in these images from 1970, except for the coloring of the photos and their clothes, are probably very similar to what you would be seeing as you walk down streets in Nepal today in small shops. The techniques have continued on. And I want to thank Himalayan Art Initiative and other small underfunded groups that are helping to preserve crafts and arts traditions. This is a, a more recent photo from, from Nepal. And tanka mountings were made by tailors. And this continues on today. And this is modern. She is a woman tailor, and she is sewing a lot of the tanka mountings for painters in uh, the Kathmandu Valley. Directly following the Nepal earthquake, I returned to Nepal to tour Damajin monasteries and offer preservation resources. Oh, the tour was too fast, two monasteries a day. It would have been ideal to be able to stay in with each for a month to work with them on preserving post earthquake disaster problems. I'm grateful to, though to Koryuk for designing this tour and, um, and I was grateful to have met such devoted and brilliant people as you can see in this photo. We created a report containing excellent observations and suggestions by the monastics themselves about their own monasteries in recovery. When I work in monasteries, it's never top down. I am not the expert. We work together. This is a picture of Tranga Rinpoche, if your images have advanced in my studio in uh, Halifax. Exactly, I'm speaking from that very room. I am very grateful to Tranga Rupche because he has been so patient with me asking many questions from the 70s on about preservation. Here's a quote from the 70s from Tranga Rupche. One needs to be aware first of the reason for tankas and other religious art. Religious art is not just for beauty, it's for teaching and developing inner wisdom and compassion. And it's not meant just for decoration. So that is true that a conservator is to stabilize and not, quote, beautify old lineage tanka treasures. This is important. Does the application of science and preservation affect the sacred nature of tankas, especially as one of the foundational beliefs of Buddhism is impermanence? Since 1970, 
I've been so privileged to interview Buddhist teachers on this and other profound and nuanced issues. I'm also grateful to the uh, Range family who taught me in the 70s all about how to make tankas. Yes, I have painted tankas, but I'm grateful to have learned from masters. I do love working in fancy museums, but I love more working in remote monasteries. The more remote, the better. And I have monastic friends that have been my friends for years, while some in this picture since 2005. We keep in touch and uh, every day almost, I get a social media message from a monk or nun in a monastery asking about preservation concerns. These are confidential because I answer them back exactly the information they need and I don't share their correspondence with anyone. What's the function of a tanka? Tankas are serving as a text for populations who did not know how to read for centuries. It's a guide to their meditation visualization. The thing is that the tanka form is not separate from the world of texts. They work closely together. And most tankas, except for the rare kind, as we talked about, where a great meditation master had a terma realization and could also paint it. Almost all other tanka iconography that you see comes from texts. Recently, uh, Dojipshin Rinpoche, very traditional, engaged a painting master to illustrate a lengthy Buddhist text. The text had never been illustrated, but he knew that his students, especially today, were too busy to read the text. But many would see the Tanka series illustrating the text, most likely in digital reproduction form. You see many Tankas with large portions of text, either on the front or on the reverse. The Tanka is a Buddhist religious object. It's in the form of a scroll. It's a very complex in its construction because it includes a painting, textile mounting, sometimes with leather corners, pendant ribbons, textile cover, a cord to hold up the cover, a cord to hang the Tanka from, top and bottom wooden dowels, and a wooden or metal decorative knobs on the bottom and other things. A full tanka form is the painting and the mounting. This is an example of a full tanka form and some documentation on it. We'll be talking about documentation later. Tankas are three dimensional. They're like a sculpture. They're not flat. I described all of the different components of a tanka, and the fact is that they are very challenging for a conservator to work with or for a monastic to preserve because the different elements are at war with each other. And three-dimensionality of 
how can I put it, of the way tankas deteriorate in their physical form. Because traditional tankas were painted with thick layers of hand ground pigment, the three dimensionality of the paintings themselves is significant. For example, in this painting, if you were to fly over it in a drone, you'd see, whoa, like you're flying an airplane. You'd see mountains, uh, rock formations, fields. You'd see lakes. And that's what it's like as we're looking at traditional tanka painting. Science matters in preservation of tankas because we have to know what the tanka is made from in order to preserve it. On the left is a traditional tanka painter in his gold robe. On the right is a current tanka master. On the left, he had a whole a school full of apprentices to create his canvases, to distill the hide glue, distill the glue. It took months to make his hide glue, to grind his pigments. On the right, the master painter does not have anyone available to do that, and he has to use some commercial pigments and paints. Is it a tanka if it's only the painting? Is it a tanka if it's only the textile mounting? The thing about high art is an overlay of aesthetics to tankas, to the original tanka form, in that many museums had only the painting displayed and the textile mountings were just thrown away. And I do have a study collection of many textile mountings from those times when they were being discarded. The Tanka Forum, it evolved because of the Gar. Great teachers and their monasteries would travel from valley to valley on the back of yachts and everything had to be portable. The Tankas, the texts, the tents, the robes. And here's an example of a painting of a Gar. They've moved the teacher and his students and the text and the tent, they moved from valley to valley. And these days they're still Gars. And these days for them, Tankas are being rolled up the same way they were when they were yaks. And I always ask the caretakers, where's your yak? You could easily transport these flat. The tanka form evolved through the centuries and through locations, materials that are available just as statues have. You have here um, at the bottom, you have a traditional metal statue and on the left, you have a composite statue that's cast in synthetic. And on the right, you have a beautiful medicine Buddha, which is created by total synthetic blue and shows luminosity. In the tanka form, copying is very traditional. When a tanka became old and very damaged, it was preserved, but a new one might be painted to share the iconography in the original primary colors. The same with tanka mountings, using what's available in traditional form. This is an example. This is in 2005, one of my favorite teachers in Bhutan who's since deceased. And in his office, he was showing me his favorite lineage tanka that was right next to a plastic calendar tanka. And he found no problem at all in um, having those next to each other, the evolution of the form. Again, these days, traditional art forms are becoming contemporary art forms. You have a tanka that has a traditional mounting and a printed painting. You have all um, different sort of Chinese style with flocking. And then we have a lot of digital tankas these days, which are a whole different conservation concern, both for conservators and for monastics. There are some tankas that indeed have no painting. They're all textile. If you want to know more about tanka form and preservation, here's a webinar that goes on for quite a while, and maybe you'll love it. It will answer lots of questions, has great pictures. Tanka conservation in monasteries. Basically, it's about documentation, preventing further damage through your risk assessments. 
planning ahead for disasters, and planning how to protect your tankas and other monastery treasures with your team. Create safer storage. If necessary, stabilize the tanka form with small mens and stay connected with trusted conservation resources who are always at your beck and call, like myself. Tank conservation in monasteries begins with documentation. Here, let's use this tanka as an example. What do you, all of you with us today, see in this tanka when you look at it? Some will see iconography. Some will see condition. Some will see other things about this tanka. For example, a monk, I asked about this tanka, what did he see? He said he saw Amitayu practice, long life practice that the monks in his monastery are now doing. And he could relate it to a text which, he, which they were using. That's very traditional. I showed this to a gallery owner and he said, an art gallery owner, he knows a lot about tankas. He says it's 18th or 19th centuries old. The price at a market, for example, um, at an auction house in Hunker or New York or Paris would be probably $10,000 US. And then uh, another scholar talked about the iconography showing that it's a Gelug iconography tanka. And the central figure is Amitai, Amitaya's Buddha with Ratnasambhava Buddha, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, there's Namgyalma and White Tara, Vajrasattva and Vajrapani. That's a scholar and a monastic. As a conservator, I research and document the history of this tanka. I want to interview elders in the monastery who might know its history. This is really important for conservation of tankas and monasteries, your research and documentation. You want to ask the elders, when did it arrive in the monastery? How did it arrive? Its use in storage. You want to measure it, write a description of its condition, do digital photography with lots of light sources, and samples perhaps for scientific testing. Documentation is so important. And in Treasure Caretaker Training, we do workshops on easy documentation for the monastics with their own smartphones. It's so easy. And video interview of elders who know the history of your monastery tankas. Now, the workshops are ongoing. I worked in one monastery in 1991 with tanka caretakers. 2005, 2008, 2012, 2014, 2016, and I continue to visit there and I'm available to their current caretakers. And that's because caretakers change. Many monasteries have no documentation or inventory of their tankas at all, partially due to confidentiality, due to the waning tradition of oral transmission, and the caretakers are moved frequently to other roles. Everyone that I've worked with in monasteries who's done documentation with us really loves it. I think you'll recognize some of the monks and nuns in these pictures doing their documentation of their own monastery treasures. They have their list of what you write in your documentation either written or on your computer or smartphone. Take pictures and label them. He's an excellent documenter. One is entering, one monk is entering paper, one is entering in his smartphone. And these nuns, well, they're all documenting and writing. This tanka, which came from the nunnery of one of the nuns, and it was the prized tanka of that nunnery. Our treasure caretaker training workshops are sustainable. This is a nun from the 2005 picture, and now she's teaching monks how to do documentation of their own tankas. Again, we want to prevent further damage through risk assessment, first documentation, 
then risk assessment. You want to plan ahead for disasters, how to protect tunkas and other monastery treasures during a disaster takes planning. Plan who's on your team and what your predetermined tunka priorities are. Risk assessment is quite important and we have our risk assessment documents translated into several languages. It works well within monasteries and nunneries because monks and nuns are so practical and totally can relate to events that happened in all the risk categories in their own monasteries. Rodents, rain, water. An upcoming Zoom we're doing with Buddhist Store Global is all about risk assessment for monasteries and Dharma leaders. Please join us for that on December 15th. Conservation in monasteries, how do things fall apart? It relates to both the nature of the tanka form and traditional use in monasteries of tankas. Tankas are found in monasteries everywhere. Different styles of tankas, um, old, new, so many different kinds. Some are very old traditional, uh, some are uh, recently painted, and some are digital. Traditional use for all of them creates damage from very respectful and devoted handling and storage. Here's the butter lamp and incense, creating smoke and grit, which darkens a lot of tankas. This rare tanka shows historical damage from usage. It was rolled and unrolled and traveled everywhere. In storage, it's not like storage like museums. Storage in monasteries, everything is still sacred in storage. And there's a lot of devotion in storage areas. In monasteries, sometimes tankas on display in the shrine room are the last thing you're thinking about. Here, this is a, a Nyingma lineage leader, and it was his last tour of monasteries before he died. He knew he was dying. And everyone from the village crowded in from the surrounding monasteries. And the tankas were rubbed against by children and um, monks and nuns and everyone. But um, they were not being disrespectful to the tankas. They really wanted to see this great teacher one last time. And this is what happens to traditional tankas. You know, they're rolled and unrolled and a darkening from incense and butter lamps. And the spots you see on the lower left of this image are from offering the chupan, um, to offering substances and flicking them towards the tanka. All respectful. I wanted to show you that uh, video because it, it looks like a wall painting, but it's actually a great a painting by a, a tanka painting by a great tanka master that was uh, displayed on a wall in a money house. And there's a lot of damage by people rubbing against it, children scratching it, insect and excrement, as well as the artist was concerned. So he applied varnish of an unknown substance that later darkened. Later, clear tape was added at the edges. I think that paintings on walls 
unless they're painted directly on the wall, are a concern the same way tanka paintings are. And yet, tanka paintings um, themselves uh, are sometimes damaged by being against a wet wall. For example, in this cave, just as there are many tanka forms, there are also monasteries and nunneries where the tankas live. The damp cave wall and the humidity in the cave are definitely having an effect on this tanka, but it's not a museum. This tanka is used. It's being used for its purpose, and that's why it's there. Tankas in monasteries are often not destroyed. And thank goodness when their iconography is not being used or if they're being replaced by a bright, bright modern tanka, sometimes they're hung in a respectful place. This is near a shrine. Yeah, there's a lot of water damage to tankas because of that, and because of wet walls. During the monsoon, sometimes people think that um, putting plastic on is a good idea, but it's not. Theft and vandalism are real concerns for conserving monastery treasures. As, as you know, this is from Kathmandu. Earthquakes. And the thing about these pictures I'm showing you is that risk assessment, which we're going to cover in an upcoming Zoom, but also the importance is in planning disaster response. Have your team ready. Know where the most valuable treasures in the monastery are, where your resources are, and also know how to avoid damage like fire. You'll see me standing under some wires in Kathmandu in a popular corner. And I show this because electrical fire can be quite damaging in monasteries. This entire traditional monastery, centuries old, burnt down. All the tankas were destroyed because of bad electrical wiring. Preserving your tankas can be as simple as being mindful about insect and rodent access. Some monasteries are half indoors, half outdoors, so birds have a lot of access. You can clean this. Light can be very damaging. Of course, there are still some um, of these old fluorescent tubes. We're replacing them with LED. Sunma, who you already know, maybe she's watching this. She is showing us some fading from light in textiles. You can conserve your monastery tanka treasures by being mindful of light exposure. Handling. Even something as how you raise a tanka cover affects it. The old tanka covers were very fragile. Cleaning hands before handling tankas is a good conservation. Handling tankas from the outside so the painting isn't crushed by your fingers. All of these are so practical and low cost suggestions. You can prevent further damage through safer storage in your own monastery, and we'd love to help design monastery storage room, low cost and practical. Safe storage is also traditional, yes, in that it's respectful with some changes in storage room furniture and access. Again, storage rooms are considered as sacred in a way as the shrine room because sacred tankas and other treasures are there. Traditional tanka storage has the tankas rolled up in trunks. 
that causes a lot of damage. When this monk is sorting through all the tankas to find what he wants, he's crushing the painting with his fingers. The rolled up tankas are getting damaged by the ribbons keeping wrapped around them to keep them closed. And also they're crushing each other in the trunk. This is one of my storage room redesigns for um, a monastery. Very low cost and very practical for the same storage room. We use locally sourced materials. We find out what the plastics are made from so that we're not using anything that will degrade. You'd be surprised in the local shops what wonderful material you can find for your storage area. I'm really happy to um, go over this with you. They're using market cloth to use, to, they're going to roll their tankas in it. And the tankas that are flat and not rolled, they're going to wrap the, sh cover the shelf and cover the top of the tanka with this market cloth. It has been boiled to get out any manufacturer's residue, and then it's dried in the sun to further clean it. Robes especially, Chum dance robes and um, great teacher's robes can be stored, um, yeah, not rolled up tightly, but with this cloth. Do not use acid-free tissue, even if a conservator says tissue is really not good to store in tankas and monasteries, especially because of monsoon reasons. And insects and rats just love it. I do not expect your monastery or nunnery to have storage like this. Not even many museums can, but this is an example of ideal, total open budget storage for tankas. Thank you, Ruben Museum, for this picture. monastery museum like this where it's interesting it's in a museum it's a shrine room and of, of many lineages and uh, the lighting is low there aren't insects the temperature and relative humidity is controlled it's almost perfection for uh, conservation of tankas and other things in it uh, hard to achieve though within most monasteries especially in the concrete buildings and old stone buildings Again, physical damage. It's not intentional, it's traditional. We're not blaming monasteries. Look at this tanka, series um, of Milarepa tankas. They're very beautiful. Uh, is documentation, risk assessment, and mm, some adjustments to storage and handling. This caretaker is so traditional, he's covering his mouth so he doesn't breathe on them. He's using a kata. But the tankas are damaging each other by crushing each other with their own weight. I know some in the audience want to know which conservation treatments were historically and are currently used with tankas in monasteries. Very few, as a matter of fact. Here the nuns are working on a monastery tanka, a nunnery tanka by request from one of their nunneries. And all we're doing is simple mends to the textile form. 
we're not doing cleaning, we're not doing overpainting, we're not touching anything, we're just stabilizing. Stabilizing is the word for conservation of tankas in monasteries. Never try to make a historic tanka look like it was painted today. Tankas are not dirty and cannot be cleaned. There's no varnish layer like there is in Western paintings. It's never successful to try to clean and update a historic tanka. You just create permanent damage. If you want a new looking tanka, be traditional. Have a new tanka painted. Conserve historic tankas by preventing damage. From a conservator's perspective, I believe in stabilizing and respecting the historical um, usage of a tanka as a sacred art form. I work both with stabilizing the paintings and the textile mountings. I do use contemporary and synthetic materials so that anybody looking at it will be able to find out in the future what was original, what was not. Plus, everything I do is reversible. When you're recreating tanka mountings, please try to stay and respect the original form of it. Not all tanka mountings are the same. We're going to have an upcoming class for this very institute on empowerment and about the sacred nature of tankas and science. This is usually a really live topic with monastics. And uh, when we work in uh, monasteries, we talk for hours about empowerment of sacred objects, especially tankas. I look forward to seeing you all again in our next class, Science and the Sacred. Here's a few points. In summary, conservation of tankas in monasteries is about preventing damage, safer storage, and documentation. For years, we've been going into monasteries by invitation, respectfully, and just sharing some of our techniques. And the thing is that since we can't travel right now, we are creating a free online digital resource. Monks and nuns written in direct response to their own questions about preservation of tankas and other monastery treasures. Every day when I receive um, confidential questions about how I care for this tanka or this statue or my robe is torn, uh, the teacher's robe is torn, I uh, write down that question and make sure it's included in our free online preservation of Buddhist treasures resource. The gods of technology have been favorable to us today. And I thank you for joining me in this class about tanka conservation in monasteries, and I certainly look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Han. Han, I think I, it, it feels like we've um, traveled. Hello. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, so uh, anyone who has a question, you should um, raise your hand. Um, that would be helpful. I can start with one maybe for you, Anne. What is the fabric that you were talking about that is being used? I couldn't make up the word. Do you mean that uh, that uh, was being washed on the roof of the monastery? Yeah, yeah. What kind of fabric is that? That's a wonderful question. So... Basically, uh, I like to keep 
every recommendation for a monastery and nunnery low cost and practical. And that includes lo shopping local. These days we're all shopping local. So monasteries have been shopping local forever. You just, and you'd be amazed what's available. If you go to a fabric shop in the community surrounding your monastery, uh, they have all kinds of fabrics. Some are very fancy, and some are um, natural, more natural than others. Some are cotton, some are polyester. And so what I recommend is undyed cotton fabric if you can find it. And if you can't find undyed natural, then, you know, maybe uh, white. But you don't want to have even the possibility of any transfer of color. And if you can't find 100% cotton, if you can only find cotton polyester blend, that's okay too. And um, so what you want to do is, um, I said it was boiled. Actually, that was boiled. But uh, if you have a, a washing machine that can go to really high temperatures, you want to wash it uh, not with stinky detergent. You don't want anything that has a smell and leaves a residue. So sometimes it's best just to use, if you don't have unscented detergent, just to use hot, hot water with several washes. And do not use fabric softener if you're going to put it in the dryer. I really recommend uh, just hanging it in the sun for many hours because uh, fabrics are finished in the factory with formaldehyde. And formaldehyde off gases and can really damage your tankas. So you want to cleanse your market fabric of any manufacturer's residue like formaldehyde or any dye before you use it. I know that um, several conservation books for um, Tonka say, oh, and you have to use acid-free tissue and it's so expensive, you know, this is the thing. You would not want that to use that in the monastery or nunnery because oh, the rats and the insects love to eat it. Plus, during the monsoon, if you're in a monsoon region, then it just sticks to the tanka. It sticks to the painting and the fabric, and it's so hard to get off. It causes damage. So since we're shopping local, I suggest that you access local market fabric and wash it really hot water and dry it in the sun for your use in storage, not only for tankas, but for all your monastery treasures in the storage room. Of course, you want to have frequent inspections for any insect activity or any damage. I hope that answered your question. Yes, very good. Thank you. Uh, all this uh, list of things to do, you have a list like this that um, we could use, for example, at Tech Chuckling? We do. As a matter of fact, the risk assessment chapters are all available. I can send them to you. And each risk assessment chapter is written in response, direct response to questions from monks and nuns. The images are from monasteries and nunneries. And each chapter has been reviewed, not only by monks and nuns, but by a scientist in the field. For example, a world expert on museum theft, a world expert on um, insects. So every risk chapter has been thoroughly reviewed and they're offered to you in the monasteries and nunneries freely. I'll send them to you. Right now we're doing some fundraising so that we can translate it into the languages that most caretakers in monasteries uh, read, which is not English. For example, we'd love to have our risk chapters with all the images of monasteries written in response to monks and nuns questions translated into Tibetan, Mandarin, Hindi, Nepali, Zonka. So this is uh, one of our goals for our fundraising for the end of this year, because sending an English document to a caretaker in a remote monastery might not be that effective. We're currently working on the 500-page uh, chapter about tanka conservation. Wonderful work. This is so exciting to hear about. Um, Anahi, you have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Anne, for this amazing lecture. I'm really intrigued by your work. And my question is related to uh, monasteries in the Kathmandu Valley, uh, to Newar monasteries. I have been visiting many of these, especially in Patan, during my fieldwork when I was there for my master thesis. 
And sometimes I also had the opportunity to see and photograph some of their tankas called uh, Pauba in, in Newar language and also wall paintings. And many of them are also very old and damaged. And especially your projects with the monasteries intrigued me. And I wonder whether you are aware of any similar projects that exist to take care of um, the, um, the pobas and wall paintings in Newar monasteries and whether you have ever worked with Newars before in this kind of um, situations. Thank you so much for your question. I definitely have visited those monasteries. And I also want to mention that although uh, the examples for all of our answers uh, um, in the preservation manual resource have examples from Buddhist monasteries. In actual fact, uh, small historical societies, even in Canada, are reading it because uh, they can relate to uh, the problems and the answers. And I recently got some inquiries asking me to send the, the chapters to Pakistan. And so, we are definitely not saying this is for Buddhist monasteries only. And it's quite amazing how similar uh, the problems can be in terms of, uh, well, for example, in Nepal in geography and in painting materials and in techniques. And so I would uh, feel uh, sad if people felt that this information was only available for Buddhist monasteries. Definitely, we had it reviewed by top scientists and conservators on purpose so that it would be available and accurate for any cultural situation. And again, some historical societies, even in Canada, are looking at it because the information is so accessible. The way we pre present it in terms of it being low, low cost and practical solutions. That's great to hear. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I think I've been talking a long time and what I'm looking forward to now is connecting with each one of you privately um, and you can arrange to Zoom with me or uh, Teams or whatever you like. Uh, we could do it uh, just one on one with your questions or you can send me an email or phone me up or send a text or connect on social media. I certainly look forward to your questions and helping you uh, with some very humble, practical and low cost solutions that come from 50 years of experience, but also come from and are guided by my Buddhist teachers and my conservation mentors. After all, the world is a place where we work together on this and we share information. And that's why I'm so grateful to be able to have shared my some of my information with you today in this class. So thank you. <laughs>